So here's the thing. Most science is bullshit. And maybe you notice this little annotation in this hip text on screen thing that I've done. Because that's what I really mean, which is that most science that you read about in the news or see on the internet is, for the most part, kind of bullshit. And in a way, that kind of makes the first sentence of this video true too, because the way that something is portrayed in the media is what it becomes to us. So even though the way that science really is, isn't bullshit, our perceptions of its process and its results kind of are. Okay, let's break it down though. What do I mean when I say bullshit? For the most part, what I mean is sensationalist. Let's look at some recent examples, shall we? Because if I'm gonna claim credibility here, then I guess I have to cite my sources. When the astronaut Scott Kelly returned to Earth from his year on the International Space Station, news outlets started reporting that his genetic code had changed 7%. Oh my God. Listen, if 7% of Scott Kelly's DNA had changed in space, it would mean that he was coming back not as Scott Kelly, not even as a human, probably as a banana. We're only 2% different from chimpanzees and like they're a different species. So what people really meant to say when reporting that story was that the way that Scott Kelly's genes were expressed changed by 7%. So close, but it's just not. Correct. See, because our DNA isn't just our genes. It's also a bunch of things called regulators that adjust to our environment and to our circumstances to turn certain genes on and off, or maybe up or down, whatever level is being expressed. This kind of change in your genes while you're you know, living your life is called epigenetics. And it makes sense that Scott Kelly's DNA would do this because he was in a radically different environment from his regular life on Earth for a really long time. We also see this kind of change and about as much of it in people who scuba dive a lot or who climb a lot of really high altitude mountains. Your body is really smart and just wants to help you succeed. Okay, so that's just one small example. And really it's just a matter of semantics, right? Genes versus gene expression, even though as we've discussed, there is a big difference between them and that difference is very important. There are also a plentiful amount of more egregious examples like those studies that come out every once in a while saying that drinking red wine or eating chocolate or drinking beer or drinking coffee are good for you and are gonna lengthen your life. Uh, Most of the articles with a headline like this are drawing on a study that was about one specific molecule that maybe acts as an antioxidant and gets rid of the free radicals in your body and free radicals are bad molecules that cause damage to your cells but that's a pretty big leap to go from that study to saying that a whole category of foods is good for you that's not how it works i mean you'd need a whole other study or rather series of studies to come to a conclusion that broad then there's the fact that these studies are in conflict with those long-term long-running public health studies that say things like on a societal level more drinking equals higher mortality science news media really likes to ping pong back and forth between those two headlines wine will kill you wine will make you live longer chocolate will kill you chocolate will make you live longer this kind of discrepancy in reporting causes public confusion around this issue. And I will say, I think this is particularly bad around diet science. And these are the way milder examples. Like, I'm not even gonna get into the tabloid science nonsense. That is a black hole. I do not want to enter today. I'm not gonna do it. But I will say that misrepresentation of mainstream science, like in these examples that I've laid out before, contributes to confusion and lack of the public's ability to believe real science when we put it out into the world and makes them much more likely to fall for a tabloid cover. So here we have come to the crux of the issue. Why and how is science so misrepresented in the news media? <laughs> There's a series of communication studies that have sought to quantify and sort of put into words what makes a story newsworthy, like what makes a reader want to read it and therefore makes the outlet want to publish it. These criteria have changed a little bit as they've moved from the 70s to today, but honestly, they've stayed pretty much the same. People like stories about conflict and drama, so things like murder and crime and sex. People really like stories involving cute animals or celebrities. Bonus points if it includes both, I guess. But for stories that don't involve things like celebrities or sex or murder or whatever, the thing that's gonna make someone want to read a story is how it applies to them personally, how they can see it relating to them 
their own life. So people talking about science are kind of backed into a corner here. Oh dear. Oh dear. They may often feel like they have to lose some of the nuance or the detail to make their new story viable to the public. Even if they go into more accurate detail in the article itself, they often have to really sensationalize the headline to make it appealing to the reader, and often that's all the reader is going to walk away with. I mean, and this has only gotten so much worse in the oversaturation of content on the internet where everyone is competing and vying for clicks and eyeballs on things. I mean, we see this on YouTube all the time with the rise of the clickbait title and thumbnail. And that pisses people off, but it works, right? So here's the true disconnect. The fundamental nature of science is inherently at odds with this communications world. That we've built. Science's directive is to be as objective as possible and use observation and measurement to try and better understand the world around us. But for the most part, science doesn't happen in huge aha moments that are going to change the world and change your life. Science lives in tiny, incremental, minute steps, sometimes forward, sometimes back, sometimes to the side a little bit. It's mostly informed by the surrounding research, but it doesn't build linearly on top of itself. It moves in all kinds of of different directions, asking new questions and often asking questions out of order. Science kind of meanders and it doesn't always get the answer we're expecting. And that's not what makes a good headline. So journalism has to find a way to make this science content interesting and relevant to the reader. And that's where it can get dicey. And that's where the science gets warped. Now, I'm certainly not saying that journalism is to blame here. I don't think anybody's to blame, really. I'm a science writer and communicator myself, and this is something that I struggle with every day. Because I think that this disconnect between the way that science actually is, how it actually works, and the way that it's represented to us causes a rift. It's a lack of shared understanding or common language between scientists and mathematicians and engineers and the lay public. And this is all without even scratching the surface of like fictionalized media and the way it represents science and scientists to the public. Because if I talk about that too today, I might actually give myself an ulcer. But I think if we talk about it the right way, if we make a shift in the way that we represent science in the entertainment and news media, we can better understand what science is and what it's actually telling us. And I think we can all agree that that's important for everybody in the world to understand the progress that we're making, how it works, and to feel connected to it. I don't have any answers, but I am trying to be someone who does this kind of work at Seeker, at Lawrence Livermore, at the Gladstone Institute, a bunch of other different places. I'll link all the places you can find me down in the description below. But I'd love to have you along for the ride, and I'd love to know your ideas and your thoughts on this issue and how we can move forward and make it better. So like this video, subscribe, etc. This video is basically just like the contents of my brain on a daily basis. I'm thinking about this all the time, and I would love to talk to you about it. So let's chat. Okay. I feel better. I feel better. Okay. Thanks. Bye.